Hello, this is Tony Haller from RealClimateScience.com, setting the record straight about climate. Young Earth creationists believe that Earth is several thousand years old, but some climate scientists seem to believe that Earth's history began about 60 years ago. Zeke House father from Berkeley Earth made this tweet discussing changes in Earth's temperature since the year 1960. The map shows a planet on fire. You can practically see the flames shooting up out of the Arctic. Zeke said, the world as a whole is warmed by 0.9 C just since 1960, with some parts of the Arctic warming by more than 4 C. Here's a map of warming between January 1960 and August 2019. Note the very detailed contouring in this map, even in places like Antarctica where they only have a small handful of stations. That's a dead giveaway that the map is fake. They're showing precision much greater than their accuracy. No serious scientist would do something like that. Let's look at the details now. Berkeley Earth shows Antarctica warming significantly. This is very different from a study from NASA made by Gavin Schmidt. In 2004, Gavin Schmidt wrote, while most of the Earth warmed rapidly during recent decades, surface temperatures decreased significantly over most of Antarctica. And NASA published this map shortly thereafter, showing in blue the cooling which had occurred over most of Antarctica. If we assume that the NASA map is correct, which shows cooling for several decades prior to 2005, then the only way the Berkeley Earth map could be correct would be if Antarctica had warmed a lot since the year 2005. Let's take a look at that. This is satellite data for the South Polar region going back to 1979. There has been little or no warming in Antarctica, particularly since the year 2005. So how did Berkeley Earth determine that Antarctica is warming when neither NASA nor satellite data shows any such thing? We're seeing a lot of indicators that the Antarctic data in the Berkeley Earth map is meaningless. In 1976, National Geographic published these satellite photos of Antarctic sea ice. This is summer sea ice on the left and winter sea ice on the right. As you can see, there was almost no sea ice left around Antarctica in January 1976. Just a tiny little bit of ice left fringing the edges of the continent. I don't see any reason to believe that the Berkeley Earth trends for Antarctica are correct. Based on the increase in Antarctic sea ice since the 1970s, it appears that the NASA map showing cooling is much more credible. So how did Zeke cherry pick the year 1960 to start his trend? Well, in 1961, the New York Times reported that there was a unanimous consensus among scientists that Earth was cooling. And as I discussed in my previous video, if you want to show an upwards trend, you start at a very cold year. It's not science, but that's how you do propaganda. So let's look at the 1974 temperature graph from the National Center for Atmospheric Research. Zeke started his temperature trend in 1960, right near one of the coldest points of the last century. Like I said, it's not science, but if you're trying to do propaganda, starting your trend at a low point is an excellent way to do it. By 1970, the United States and Soviet Union were pondering a new ice age. New York Times, July 18, 1970, U.S. and Soviet press studies of a colder Arctic. The United States and the Soviet Union are mounting large-scale investigations to determine why the Arctic climate is becoming more frigid, why parts of the Arctic sea ice have recently become ominously thicker, and whether the extent of that ice cover contributes to the onset of ice ages. That does not sound like a planet on fire. But our top scientists had a plan to save us from global cooling. They were going to sprinkle coal dust on the ice pack in order to melt it and warm the earth up. On March 2, 1975, the front page of the Chicago Tribune said, Brr, new ice age on way soon. In the last decade, the Arctic ice and snow cap has expanded 12%, and for the first time in this century, ships making for Iceland ports have been impeded by drifting ice. Once again, that does not sound like a planet heating out of control. Now let's look at U.S. temperatures, which Zeke shows rapidly warming since the year 1960. Here's a graph of average mean temperatures for the United States for every year going back to the year 1900. I marked where Zeke's start point is, very close to the low point on the graph once again. Temperatures prior to 1960 declined sharply, but temperatures since 1960 have warmed. So once again, if you're a propagandist trying to show warming, you find a low point and start your graph from that point to show a warming trend. The untampered temperature trend for the United States over the past century is downwards. If we look at afternoon temperatures in the United States, we can see that they have declined sharply over the past century. 
Zeke's map shows the United States warming rapidly, but the actual data shows no such thing. Next, let's look at the Arctic. In 1939, it was reported, scientists have confirmed the fact that the Arctic regions around Spitsbergen are warming up at a rate of approximately one degree every two years. Since 1910, when observations first started in those regions, the cumulative rise of winter temperature has amounted to nearly 16 degrees. So from 1910 to 1939, the Arctic was warming very quickly. And that period of Arctic warming is reflected in the sea ice graph published by the Department of Energy in 1985. Sea ice diminished sharply from the year 1925 until the year 1960, which guess what? That's when Zeke starts his trend. How surprising that Zeke would start his trend right at the low point for Arctic sea ice. Every direction from the low point is up, whether you go forwards in time or backwards in time. Let's look at an article now from the year 1954, which was the second lowest point on record. In 1954, it was reported that the average temperature of the inhabited parts of the Earth had risen about 2 degrees Fahrenheit within the past 100 years, and that winter temperatures at Spitsbergen in the eastern Arctic had risen about 19 degrees Fahrenheit, or 11 degrees Celsius, since the year 1910. That's a lot more than the 4 degrees warming in the Arctic, which Zeke has reported since the year 1960. And what were scientists blaming it on in the year 1954? Well, carbon dioxide, of course. So in 1954, Earth had been warming very rapidly since the year 1910, but by 1961, there was unanimous consensus that Earth was cooling. So something drastic happened between 1954 and 1961. The Arctic went from rapid warming to rapid cooling, and obviously it wasn't due to carbon dioxide. It had to be something else. Here's the NASA graph of temperatures in the capital of Iceland from back in the days before they started tampering with the data. You could see that there was rapid warming until the 1940s, and then rapid cooling until the year 1979, and then rapid warming again. There's no correlation with carbon dioxide, but there's very close correlation with ocean circulation patterns. This graph shows in red the Atlantic multi-decadal oscillation, and you can see a very close correlation between that and temperatures in Iceland. So there's no valid reason to try to force-fit a carbon dioxide theory of warming when ocean circulation patterns can explain it quite adequately. At least no reason unless your funding depends on force-fitting a carbon dioxide theory. Let's look now at a few more news articles about this period of warming. 1947, melting ice cap danger, warmer Arctic temperatures. If the Antarctic ice regions in the major Greenland ice cap should reduce at the same rate as they are at present melting, oceanic surfaces would rise to catastrophic proportions and people living in the lowlands along the shores would be inundated. Wow, does that sound familiar. Dr. Allman added that temperatures in the Arctic have increased 10 degrees Fahrenheit since 1900, an enormous rise from the scientific standpoint. Now let's compare that to the 1975 Chicago Tribune article. In the last decade, the Arctic ice and snow cap has expanded 12%, and for the first time in the century, ships making for Iceland ports have been impeded by drifting ice. So obviously the Arctic cooled a lot between 1947 and 1975. And that was during a time when carbon dioxide was rapidly increasing in the atmosphere. It's pretty obvious that CO2 does not control the climate. Here's another article from 1955, Melting Arctic Ice Warming Up World. There are now 6 million square miles of ice in the Arctic. There was once 12 million square miles. Another thing, almost every glacier, with one exception, has retreated, going back into the hills, is smaller than it was. So the extent of Arctic sea ice had declined by 50% by the year 1955. No wonder they're hiding the data before 1960. And here's a story from 1922. The Arctic Ocean is warming up, icebergs are growing scarce, and in some places the seals are finding the waters too hot. Reports from fishermen, seal hunters, and explorers, he declared, all point to a radical change in climatic conditions and hitherto unheard of temperatures in the Arctic. At many points, well-known glaciers have entirely disappeared. While carbon dioxide levels are very low in 1922, this pretty much destroys the belief system of people who are trying to blame Arctic melting on carbon dioxide. 
The idea that carbon dioxide causes Arctic melting is completely unsupportable from a scientific point of view. In fact, the Arctic was ice-free six to 7,000 years ago when carbon dioxide levels were very low. In 1939, all of the glaciers in eastern Greenland were rapidly melting. And it may without exaggeration be said that those glaciers, like those in Norway, face the possibility of a catastrophic collapse. And 30 years later, after carbon dioxide levels had increased, the New York Times was talking about a new ice age. It's pretty clear now why the data is being hidden before 1960. This ClimateGate email shows us that climate scientists were aware of and were troubled by the warmth of the 1940s. So they discussed ways to make the 1940s warmth disappear. This is a letter from Tom Wigley at NCAR to Phil Jones at the Climatic Research Unit in England. If we could reduce the ocean blip by, say, 0.15 degrees Celsius, then this would be significant for the global mean, but we would still have to explain the land blip. It would be good to remove at least part of the 1940s blip, but we're still left with, why the blip? So they made a decision to get rid of the 1940s warmth, and they didn't even have an explanation for why they were doing it. This is not science, it's propaganda and fraud. And they did exactly that. This is the 1974 NCAR graph in black and the current NASA graph in red. They completely got rid of the cooling after 1940. Let's review the cherry picking again. Zeke started his trend at a low point in 1960. He also started his trend near a low point in US temperatures. He started his trend right at the low point in sea ice. So someone on Twitter asked Zeke why he started in 1960. Zeke responded with, because I made the underlying data set for National Geographic, who have a map of warming since 1960 they want updated. You could go further back, though you start having gaps prior to the mid-1950s, since we don't have any measurements in Antarctica before that point. Fair enough, except for the fact that his Antarctic data after 1960 was also fake. So why does National Geographic want to start in 1960? Well, that's easy to explain. This graph is from the November 1976 issue of National Geographic, and it shows the tremendous warmth of the 1930s and 1940s, which National Geographic doesn't want anyone to remember. So they're simply hiding the hot temperatures prior to 1960. The key principles of climate alarmism are cherry picking, data tampering, and hiding critical data. We are witnessing the biggest scam in science history. Visit Toto on the web at realclimatescience.com. He's been pulling back the curtain on junk science and propaganda for a long time.